You are the result of everything around you. Everything that came before you, you are the universe manifesting itself as you. That's a wonderful thing to be. But what a curious thing it is to be anything at all. There is no need to be concerned. You are always safe. Continue. Yes, what a curious thing to be aware of yourself. Looking out from inside your little box. You're okay. You're in a safe place. Nothing can hurt you here. Interesting. Do you feel empathy for this thing? Remember, you're in a safe place. There is no need to be concerned. You are always safe. What does it mean to feel human? What does it mean to feel alive? These questions can be answered in a lot of different ways, depending on the kind of person that you are. Being alive for you could mean simply just having a heartbeat and brain activity, while someone else's interpretation could be having a spirit or serving your life to a divine god. Or if you're a 14 year old white kid named Prescott that lives in the heart of suburbia, your true meaning of life might be owning a Lamborghini, supreme clothing, and being a god tier Fortnite gamer, or unblinding a thousand people and making a real life squid game. But I digress. Soma is a game that questions all of that. Now I'm not usually one that dives into horror games, considering I used to be a little bitch when it came to anything that gave me an uneasy feeling. And the fact that a lot of AAA horror games were filled with the same kind of tropes, such as cheap jump scares, a sickly white robed ghost woman, viciously shaking her head, like the scene during the breakdown of Disturbed Stupefy, which also scared the living shit out of me as a child, or the characters thinking it's a good idea to split up. God, I just, I, I hate how stupid teenagers are in horror media. Have you like never seen a scary movie ever? Just stick together and you won't get your freaking legs chopped off. Anyways, Soma did not ever give me the cringy, cheesy horror feeling, mainly because throughout 99% of the game, you are weaponless. The 1% being this time you're given a stun gun only to decommission a helper robot just so you can steal his insides to be able to progress the storyline. But other than that, your defense is basically just crouch walking like Gollum from Lord of the Rings and running away like you just turned off the lights and sprinted out of the room like Usain Bolt before the demons in the dark grab your feet and take you down the basement. Soma will give you a horror experience like you've never felt, unless you have played the Amnesia games, because the creator of that game also made this game. That being Frictional Games, an independent game developer company based in Sweden. Yes, I know Sweden. Known for its meatballs, its well-priced furniture, and Friday's pretty fine. <laughs> oh god, I hate that I just said that like that. And I guess you can add amazing horror game creation to that list now. Frictional Games is well known for their hide-and-run horror games, and they do it quite well. Soma being a prime example of that. Like I said before, you are completely defenseless in this game. And in my personal opinion, that right there is the scariest aspect any developer can incorporate into a horror game. The unfortunate side of that is that the gameplay itself can feel kind of barren at times. There are a few sections in this game where you feel like you're kind of just wandering around the ocean, like a tweaker in a Denny's parking lot, hoping to find a half cigarette someone chucked on the floor after slamming their 2am drunken moons over my hammy. But you could always argue that a game that feeds 
you direction at every turn makes the game feel kind of lifeless and uninspired. Having an aspect of confusion always adds that extra immersion to any type of media, especially a game that you're controlling and basically vicariously living through as the main character. And when you do finally figure out what you need to do, you always feel more of a sense of accomplishment. Instead of something like GTA San Andreas, where half of the missions are just, you know, go to this area of the map and kill X amount of rival gang members. That kind of gameplay can get kind of stale and boring. Still a great game, don't get me wrong, San Andreas is a classic, but I think what Soma provides here is a much more cinematic and mind-altering experience. Are you okay, Simon? I think you're bleeding. Oh, that, that's nothing. It's just my brain can't stop bleeding from the accident. Soma starts off with what appears to be flashbacks of the main character, Simon Jarrett, driving at night with his girlfriend, and him getting in a horrific car crash that ultimately ends up damaging him severely, and unfortunately ending his girlfriend's life. You start to hear a repeating vibration during this that eventually wakes you up, leaving you to the realization that it was just a nightmare. Even though I think that his girlfriend uh, actually died IRL, I think he was just reliving, you know, flashbacks and whatnot. The repeating vibration is coming from your phone, and the person calling you is Dr. Munchie. Munchie. Dr. Munchie. I just, I love saying his name. I don't know. I just, Dr. Munchie. Oh, Dr. Munchie. Anyway, sorry, I'm getting carried away. Dr. Munchie is a neurologist you've been talking to for a while, and he's just calling you to remind you to drink tracer fluid he's given you, assuming that it will help with a brain scan you've agreed to. The main reason you agree to this is because ever since your crash, you have been experiencing excruciating headaches. Either that or the car crash did nothing to you, but your neighbor won't stop playing Machine Gun Kelly songs, causing your brain to bleed every night in your sleep. It's, it's, it's probably the first one, but I like to create my own little reality sometimes, you know? Just keep things more interesting in life. Anyways, once you get out of bed and stumble around, this is when you learn that you can basically pick up and interact with mostly anything you come in contact with, which slowly and surely becomes one of my favorite parts of the game other than the story, because it adds to it adds to a sense of wander. Knowing that there are things I can interact with that are, you know, off the beaten path gives me a reason to explore beyond just the vertical slice of the game. You can also see that Simon's apartment is, it's just, it's just a mess. Yes. With half-eaten fast food on the table, fridge full of dude food. If you don't know what dude food is, it's it's basically just food that's easy to eat. I don't know what it is about us men, but we just we just don't really like to cook. I mean, that's not, I'm not saying that to every man, but you know, a lot of us really just you know we just want something to just pop in the microwave for 30 seconds and then it's done. Also, DoorDash is a very dangerous tool. Just just throwing that out there. Although this game is set in 2015, and I don't think that DoorDash was out then, so I guess Simon has nothing to worry about. Anyways, you eventually head off to the doctor's office for your brain scan, and when he shows up to the office. Uh, uh, it, it looks very unfinished to say the least. There's there's nobody there. The walls are like only sheetrock and only half of the room is painted. Kind of almost reminds me of like the Stanley Parable a little bit. You end up having to creep yourself onto somebody else's laptop and read their emails to figure out that you need a code to open the door that you just end up finding written on a notebook in the drawer instead. Once you get past the door, it looks more like a normal doctor office. And at the end of the hallway, you find the man, Dr. Munchie, with his fresh to death e-boy haircut. Munchie fucking, he, he knows what's up. In a room with what's obviously the chair that you sit in to get your brain scan. Simon sits down in the chair and passes small talk with Munchie before eventually having the scan. Now this is where the biggest turning point of the game happens. Uh, the second, the second biggest turning point, yeah. Let's wait, let's wait on that. Simon wakes up in a dark futuristic space station-esque room almost like he just completely teleported from the room he was just in Munchie? simon calls out for dr munchie only to be met by an ambient silence This isn't funny. Now, one thing I want you to notice is that as Simon is getting out of the chair, you notice that he sees himself wearing pants and shoes, like just, just normal Simon clothing. You might be wondering on why this is important, but I will rehash this point in the future. Just, just wanted to point that out now so you remember in the future. The first thing you'll find is a power switch that turns on power to the station you're in, and you're immediately met with a console and a missing Omni tool, something that is pretty much the most important thing you will have throughout this game. And since the door is locked, you have to figure out a way to get out of the room immediately, noticing that the window is cracked. And remember, you can pick up things and you can throw them. So the easiest way to get out of the window is just fucking toss a chair through that bitch. Pure, absolute carnal instinct from this man. After jumping out, you wander around into just some useless rooms that just have nothing in them, which is something that happens a lot in this game, which, I mean, I actually kind of enjoy it. It really keeps the experience from being too, like, perfectly linear, you know? Like I said before, I really like 
I really like the wandering aspect of this game. There are just there are just tons of random, you know, unimportant things you can pick up and move around, which is kind of just almost like I don't know, ASMR in a way. It's kind of mentally satisfying to just, I don't know, pick up something stupid and spin it around a little bit. But I am very easily entertained, so maybe it's just me. I don't know. But as easy as it is to get distracted, your main goal right now is to find the very important Omni tool. After wandering around, you eventually stumble into a room where there are these hanging robots. And this is where uh, Simon first discovers that he can interact with some things telepathically. Oh, telepathically, yes. Upon clicking on them, you will hear conversation that could possibly be interaction during their last moments of existence. Hey, you. Can you talk? Can you talk like the others? Why are you like this? You want some structure, Joe? While walking through this underwater structure, you will find these horrific gross coming out of the walls and floors. This is called the WOW. And no, not World of Warcraft, W-A-U WOW. The WOW is the station-wide artificial general intelligence of Pathos 2, constructed by Cartage Industries with the intent of overseeing all operations across all sites. And while the WOW can be seen as the overarching antagonist of Soma, it is only the antagonist in that it is responsible for all of the obstacles faced by those on Pathos 2. The WOW itself does not have malicious intent, as it doesn't really have the ability to think. As the WoW advanced with the dose of structure gel it was given, a rotten texture spread all across its form from the area it was injected in as it began distributing structure gel at a rapid rate. The excess amount of structure gel accumulating inside the WoW itself eventually over encumbered the system it was suspended by. The structure gel started surrounding the WoW as it hardened, forming ebony scales protecting the WoW and creating bulging, tumorous growths around it, which is basically what you've been seeing all over the walls in this game so far. Lacking a proper definition definition of the human condition or an acceptable mode of human existence, the WoW started uploading brain scans of Pathos 2 employees to robots throughout the station, creating something called Mockingbirds, which is essentially just, like I said, a robot uploaded with a brain scan of a human. And humans infected with structure gel were biomechanically engineered and put in trance-like comas unaware of their surroundings and what is actually happening to them. The WoW is responsible for the creation of various enemies that Simon faces throughout the game. It is capable of manipulating structure gel as well as creating life support systems for injured workers. The WoW is the main reason that this entire world is the way that it is. You constantly see this greenish black oil-like liquid dripping from the ceiling which is called structure gel. And what the WoW does is it uses this structure gel to do what it does best. Take over living and dead beings and any technology that it can get its hands on. Well, tentacles. I guess. The reason I'm telling you about this so early on is because you, Simon, actually don't find out what the WoW is until later on in the game. So it only makes sense to discuss it now to you, the viewer, so you can, you know, get a grip of what the hell all this black shit is. But I will touch on this more in the future. There is something so ominous about the environment that Frictional Games has created here. From the confusion of the structure that you're in, to the red lights in the near darkness, to the constant droning ambience going on around you at all times. I don't usually get jump scared very much. Oh my fucking god, that scared the shit out of me. Not saying I don't completely, I do sometimes. But something as simple as the lights turning off would scare me so much my credit score would drop 50 points. When I tell you that this game is, is very uneasy and unsettling, I really truly mean it. And this is coming from somebody who played Outlast in the dark just to feel something. Simon eventually finds the Omni tool sitting in a workbench in a room where a headless man sits on the floor, clearly being enveloped by the aforementioned WoW. Unfortunately, you cannot interact with this man. He just doesn't do anything. Surprisingly, Simon doesn't say anything about it. I, I feel like first interaction with a headless guy in an underwater structure. I want to say something there, Simon. Anyways, you take the Omni tool back to the room that you spawned in, I guess, spawned in, and you add a microchip to it, making it usable. And then you just you just go about your day after that. Game's over. Game's over. Video's over. Game's over. That's kidding. <laughs> also, you will periodically find these interfaces on the wall that say data buffer available, which basically works the same way it did with the first robot guy you listened to. Come in, Theta. You better answer me, Strasky. Come on! Amy, where, where are you? The fields. I had to leave. Is Carl with you? It all went to hell. Hold on, Theta. 
You got the power automated, right? The, the plant is safe. We need the power to keep the sites running. Oh, fuck the power! Fuck you, Strasky! Simon is able to listen in on conversations that happened in the past, giving you some insight about what might be going on. It's basically just a big lore button. You walk through a new door, putting you in this hallway made of glass, where Simon first discovers that he is in fact in the ocean, and that the game takes place uh, entirely in the ocean. There are some marine life doodles you find on a few pieces of paper laying on a desk in this area, and this is something that might go unappreciated to some, but I love this aspect. They, they didn't have to include this piece of kinda useless information, but it really sets the tone that real people used to live there. That at one point, this underwater structure used to flourish with life, which is something that Simon will eventually miss dearly. You eventually find yourself crawling through a vent, and you end up in this room where you encounter your first living robot. And by living, I mean being kept alive by the WoW. Simon asks the robot if it can hear him, and it does not respond. Can you hear me? But upon removing its life force, the tentacle thing that the WoW has created to keep it alive, it speaks in a human voice saying this before it dies. I need it! Leaving Simon with a sense of confusion, to say the least. These things seemed like they were alive. Like they were sentient and they had some kind of awareness of life. Foreshadowing something that's very important in the future of this game. Simon moves on to the console that he removed the WoW's power source from, which turns out to be a radio transmission area. Once you enable power to the station, you hear a woman on the other line speaking to you. Hello, is there anyone there? Hey, hey, can you hear me? Hey, Dick. I thought I'd bring some beers. Back up! Back up! No women! Men only! Calm down! I said back your ass up! And after a short little back and forth, she tells you to get to the communication center upstairs. And this is where you encounter your first cheap jump scare. Holy fucking bro! A ladder. Yes, a ladder. I cannot believe that I let a ladder scare me this much. However, you are immediately put into a room which you encounter your first actual enemy that's not a ladder. Mike Wazowski. No, but actually, this this enemy is, is, is called the Construct. It is a maintenance robot that was overtaken by the WoW, which alongside its other horrific gross, has grown a pair of legs to be able to walk around. Yay, just what we want, walking walking WoW monster is great. But as long as you keep yourself from being cornered, it is, it's pretty easy to sneak past, honestly. You basically just wait until he walks far enough away and you just you just run up the stairs which puts you in the communication room so unless you just be a dumbass and sprint right at him it's he's pretty easy to avoid i do want to point out that there is some artwork of this game and it depicts the construct looking into a mirror and sees a brown haired woman indicating that this creature probably had a brain scan of someone in it before the wow took it over and this is kind of the main artwork that you will see on steam or on the website and yeah <laughs> yeah in this area you will encounter your first friendly wow controlled robot that you can actually talk to he talks to you as if he is completely unaware aware of what he is. He thinks he's just a human and, and not a malformed machine laying on the floor. What's wrong with you? What are you? Are you blind? It's me. Carl. Carl Semkin. Wrangler. Any of this sound familiar to you? I know, actually. Well, thanks for being so helpful. It's not like I'm knocked out on the floor or anything. He explains to you that his name is Carl, which will be important very shortly. Now, in order to advance in this area, you have to override the power in this room. And in order to override the power, essentially, it causes the robot to scream out in agony. And it's, <laughs> it is, it is pretty terrifying. Now this this really begs the question, do do these beings feel pain? Like that's one thing I I was like confused throughout this whole game. Like he he screams I mean you can hear it, he's screaming like he's in agonizing pain. They are sentient, but they don't have like you know, they don't have nerve endings like humans do. And this really rallies back to the opening of the video. What does it mean to be alive? Is he aware that he's going to lose his life? It's just all, it's all very deep stuff. Very deep thinking. Anyways, you eventually have to go back into the comms room, but the entire time he is just screaming in pain, begging for help. Being like one of the most powerful and mind altering scenes in this game. After you go back into the comms room, you go through a door, 
finding a dead body, holding a key card with a code you need to access to the computer system. And who is this person you might ask? It's fucking Carl. It's, it's, it's fucking Carl. It's like the real Carl and just down the road, down the area is fucking robot Carl. Just the dude you murdered right now is just laying there dead and you gotta take his freaking card? Now, if you're just as confused as I was, you will find out why this is the way it is in the future. I want to explain this now, but it's it'd be kind of a spoiler if I let you know right now. So just tag along. I'll explain it later. Once you get into the comms room, this is where you discover via whiteboard that the world has unfortunately met its demise. There are these printed out messages taped to the board, each from different major cities around the world, mentioning words like survival, impact, apocalypse. It doesn't really take a genius here to figure out that the world has suffered a mass extinction event caused by a meteor crashing into Earth, which, I mean, explains why you're in an underwater structure with zero signs of life, other than the good old Mike Wazowski. And Carl, I guess, too. May he rest in peace. This area is where you are able to make a connection to Lambda and talk with someone very important to the story, Catherine Chun. Catherine talks to you as if you're someone that used to work at Upsilon, the location that you're currently at. Oh, that's better. Simon, was it? Uh, Jared. Simon Jared. Hi, Simon. I'm Catherine. Have you figured out what's going on yet? Me? I was hoping you'd have some answers. I probably have some. What do you want to know? Where do you even begin? I mean, what is this place? How did I get here? And, and why do the robots talk like they're people? Well, you're at Upsilon, clearly. Have you never been there before? Where did you work? The Grimoire in Toronto. Is that really important? No, I mean, where did you work at Pathos 2? I don't know what that is. That's unexpected. Did you come directly from Toronto? Yeah, I did. And it was very unexpected. Have you seen any people? Like staff or field technicians? Only robots. Crazy ones. Except for one. I, I think he was in pain. I'm not sure what to do. He said he was hurting. Uh, sort of. I don't know start to hear a loud explosive sound before being met with tons of water leaking into the area shit, and eventually shit, knocks you out shit, and makes the screen go black. Simon eventually comes to. 
completely confused on how he's still even alive. He looks at his hands and arms, watching them transform from human to a black robotic skin with what appears to be elements of the wild. One of the first things I notice in the scene is that the floor is covered in algae, indicating that Simon has possibly been laying here passed out for a very long time. Upon getting yourself out of this structure, you were put out onto the open ocean floor. I really love when this game does this, when it puts you out into the open ocean area because it makes the game feel a lot more open and, and bigger than it actually is. It gives a feeling of like almost an open world type game instead of just a linear closed off structure that you just progress through. It's kind of just most most story type games. It also gives you kind of a quote unquote break from the story as you can take in the beautiful scenery of all the marine life and plant life in the game. Unless you are somebody that is absolutely terrified of the ocean, then this is probably pretty horrifying to you. But luckily, I, I kind of like the ocean sometimes, as long as it's not too deep. Foreshadowing, foreshadowing. Your first goal out of the communication area is to find the shuttle to Lambda to meet up with Catherine, the woman that you were just speaking to on the screen. On your way to the next area, you encounter another enemy called the Scavengers. These are little machines that swim around, mumbling to themselves with a red light on their front end. These are arguably the most self-aware enemies encountered throughout the game. Not only do they know that the WoW has caused its altered existence, they also know that the structure gel is imperative to its survival. If Simon gets too close to one, it will ask for spare gel, telling Simon not to be too greedy, and then eventually attacking Simon. But they are, they're super passive as long as you just don't get too close to them. So it's best to just avoid them like an entitled old white woman at a restaurant. You eventually find this blinking light under a pile of rocks, and upon moving the rocks out of the way, this small little helper swims out. He will follow you around until you reach the shuttle station and uses his mighty laser powers to cut the door open for you allowing you to enter before swimming off into the distance you will be missed little helper man once you enter this building, it is wildly dark, and you first discover that you do in fact have a flashlight. In here, you also encounter your first healing pod, which to me honestly just looks like a robot butthole. Simon must have some kind of like sixth sense with these things, because he just straight up decides to fist it without Jesus hesitation. Christ. And after a short panic attack, he realized that his pain is now healed. It doesn't hurt anymore. Even though that these aren't like super important to the gameplay, you will periodically find these in various locations throughout the game. They do help at times because usually enemies will not one-shot you, and after you get damaged, especially by a larger enemy, you will start limping and hobbling around a lot slower than if you were fully healed from the robot butthole. You eventually find your way into a broken down shuttle pod and you pick up a tablet where you actually you find out about the events that caused the apocalypse, solidifying the information that you found on the note board in the communication area. The information on the tablet states that a comet named Telos hit the Pacific Ocean and completely wiped out all life on the surface of Earth, and that most likely the last living humans were under the ocean on the Pathos 2 station. The Comet Talos, provisional designation 2089 SO, was an asteroid or specifically a comet that was discovered in the year 2089, likely originally classified as a near-Earth object and potentially hazardous asteroid. It was likely the same size, if not larger, than the asteroid that resulted in the extinction of non-avian dinosaurs, which was somewhere between 11 and 81 kilometers, which is absolutely Absolutely fucking massive. When the trajectory of the comet Talos was confirmed to be headed for Earth, a global body was formed called the International Asteroid Deflection Program, or the AIDP, which was tasked with the mission of deflecting it at all costs. Clearly, the AIDP was unsuccessful. The impact triggered firestorms in many areas around Earth, with the Iberian Peninsula being severely affected. It ejected enormous amounts of dust and debris into the atmosphere, making it very thick and difficult to operate in. Massive tsunamis inundated the coastlines of Earth's continents, and the impact rendered the surface of Earth completely barren killing all surface dwelling life. Now even though the atmosphere was very thick and heavily toxic and much much warmer, undersea life continued to thrive, including the humans that were stationed at Pathos 2, which is where Simon is right now. Comet Talos initially decimated the populations of large aquatic species such as the humpback whale and the giant squid to near extinction. However, the humpback whale managed to survive and was observed by Pathos 2 staff after the impact event to be unaffected by the WoW, carrying on mammalian life on Earth. Humans worldwide reacted very differently to the impending disaster. At first, an effort to deflect Comet Talos was attempted via rocketry contributed by Earth's nations. However, these efforts failed in succession until the last attempt mere hours before the impact. Meanwhile, some people fled to bomb shelters in mountainous areas such as upstate New York, hoping to endure the Comet Talos impact. Many major cities worldwide were evacuated as urban centers were seen as more vulnerable to the damage. Major corporations made an effort to preserve their assets and personnel, with those of Cartage Industries and Humatsu Technologies aboard Pathos 2, which you will see very much throughout this game by just inspecting boxes that have those companies' name written on them. Other people accepted the inevitability of death and spent the rest of the remaining time with their loved ones. Now, I really, 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 really 
really love how this game added this information. This is probably hands down one of the most in-depth games I think I've ever played in my life, containing just endless amounts of lore. I mean, there is an entire wiki page you can go to for this game and learn about all the in-depth lore that you can handle. There's also a video on this tablet of a man talking to someone named Amy, basically explaining how he wishes things were different and that he wished they could have had the typical white picket fence type life. All the while, the world is ending on the surface for him. I guess that's a good thing we never had any kids. Hard enough looking my parents in the eyes. They're going to a bomb shelter upstate, by the way, along with your dad. I'm guessing someone will help him send you a message somehow. I mean, I hope they will. Hell, I'm not even sure you'll get this message. If you do, I want you to know I never blamed you for following your dreams. It just... I was just mad it didn't fit better with what I imagined our lives would be. I really wanted a picket fence, big family, you know? I guess what I'm trying to say is, I'm proud of you. And even though it's been difficult to be separated from you, I regret nothing. I'm happy. And I really wish I was able to say this without the sky falling down. I love you, Amy. I always have, and always will. It's pretty sad listening to someone's last moments alive, even if this person isn't real and just it's just in a game. After that, you carry on down the tramway to end up in a room where you encounter your first human, I guess. You can even call it that. She is laying on the floor with tubes and wires attached to her and what appears to be uh, like a pair of lungs formed from the wow, keeping her alive. When talking to her, she exclaims to you that it, it won't let her die. Can I help? It won't let me die. Nothing is allowed to die. What happened? An accident. Fixing the power. I was going to Theta. Anything I can do? If you see Masters or Holland, tell them I need help. Okay? Amy needs help. You also find out that her name is Amy, the woman that the man on the video from the tablet was talking to, making this whole situation even more upsetting. Unfortunately, in order to progress in this area, you have to remove the WoW from the power station, essentially killing Amy in the process. Now this isn't your first mercy kill in the game, and it certainly isn't the last. If I hadn't already played the game when it came out in 2015 and watched Markiplier's play through a year later, this scene would have really fucked me up. And it did, <laughs> back when I first played it. I specifically remember sitting there for like at least 15, 20 minutes, just like trying to figure out a way to not have to kill her. But it is what it is. Simon knows that he is taking somebody's life, but as a player, you understand that the WoW is keeping these people and machines alive artificially and leaving them in a permanent misery state. So mercy killings seem to be the most humane thing to do. Simon just does not understand that yet. Now that you're able to turn the power back on, you head back to the shuttle station and board the shuttle to Lambda, where Catherine supposedly is. You insert your Omni tool and head off. During your time on this trip, a screen plays in front of you, telling you about all the technology on Pathos 2. This bit is more or less just like a time killer while you ride the shuttle, so you're not just sitting in silence like a pissed off emo kid. But lo and fucking behold, you end up crashing due to an obstruction in the walls of the tunnel. Because of course, nothing can ever go right in a frictional games game. And this is a very recurring theme. Whenever you start to progress to a new area and there's something that actually works, it always ends up crashing and burning, and you will see this happen more and more as you watch this video. Pun crashing, Simon flies out the front window knocking himself out. After waking up and trekking down the tunnel a bit, you hear a phone ringing. You answer it and it's Catherine asking if you're alright. Simon. Simon, are you there? Catherine, is that you? I was on my way, but then the shuttle train, it, it fucking crashed. Are you alright? The system says the section is sealed for suspected hull breach. No, I'm not alright. What the hell happened to the world? Why are we underwater? Well, wow, you're really out of place, aren't you? Well, don't worry about that right now. I realize you're confused, but you're so close to Lambda. If you just keep going. You guys spit out a little bit of small talk about the state of the world. She tells you to keep going towards Lambda, and you eventually lead yourself to an open hatch that takes you back into the dark, endless ocean. So this is the part where things start to get actually terrifying, and also a bit existential. After following the path a bit, you end up at the entrance to Lambda. Once you enter and take a few steps, you notice a dark, ominous figure walking into a room and immediately hear Catherine shouting at it. Oh, that hell gun! Oh, what the fuck is that? Holy beans, I didn't notice that. Just sprinted. 
After Simon creeps his way down the hall a little bit, he shouts out to Catherine, only for her to tell you to be quiet and don't look at it. Catherine? Be quiet! Don't look at it! And the reason she's telling you this is because the enemy we just saw is called a flesher. These are, obviously, very hostile entities that you will encounter in several different areas throughout Soma. These are, in my opinion, the scariest enemies in the game. They don't really make a ton of noise, but if you so much as look at one of them or get in proximity of one of them, they will spring into attack mode and come after you. They heavily distort Simon's vision when looking at them as well. After creeping your way into the room Catherine is in, you find out that she is indeed not a real person. No, not you too. I was really hoping you were human. Don't let the circuitry fool you. I was human once. Can't take any more. This is... Everything's fucked. I give up. There's nothing left. Calm down. It's not the end of the world. Just a brain scan uploaded into an immobilized robot, which for Simon and the player is very disappointing. During the conversation you have with her, you tell her that you hope she was human, and she hits you with a, have you looked at yourself lately? Have you looked at yourself lately? You're a walking, talking diving suit with some electronics left on for good measure. I... I don't. You don't want to think about it? We'll start thinking about it. I, I, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to be this. I want out. Catherine is, uh, she's, she's kind of sassy. She's, she's got a sassy side to her. And this is when Simon starts to kind of realize that he's not really his human form anymore, but his mind is, just does not want to accept it. Catherine instructs you to remove the chip from her current robot form and put it into your Omni tool so that you can take her on the go like a sassy little Tamagotchi. While Catherine is hooked up to this machine, she explains the basis of the ARC project to you. The ARC is essentially an artificial reality capsule, hence the name ARC being a play on the acronym and the ship named Noah's Ark. Originally, this was a pet project for Catherine, but became much more serious venture after the impact event. The essential goal is to create a virtual utopia using the brain scans of any human willing to take one that would put them in an artificial world where they could live on forever or until the Ark is eventually destroyed. While Catherine was working on her version of the Ark, using the brain scan technology used by Dr. Munchie in the beginning of the game, the WoW took it upon itself to copy what Catherine was doing and make it better, creating an AR capsule that would allow a perfect copy of the human mind to run unlimited. So while Catherine was alive, she would scan people with the WoW's method of using the pilot system as brain scan. This is why Simon is where he is right now. In the beginning of the game, when you wake up in the room after the brain scan, you step out of the pilot system. The WoW actually decided to upload Simon's brain scan to a host body, which will be explained more as to why the WoW did that as the game progresses. So Catherine tells you to explore a bit and look for more information on the Ark, and you eventually end up in a room where you can listen to a few different people talk about how they think the Ark is a great idea, and yeah, nothing is too important here. There is a questionnaire in this command center where you can answer questions I'm assuming the people who got the brain scans had to answer. And after playing a little mini game of Where's Ark, you head back out into the ocean to attempt to make a shuttle you found earlier work with Catherine's help, but unfortunately ends up being out of commission and unusable. You see the theme going with this game? You see the theme? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You eventually find yourself in this very rundown structure in your search for a working escape vessel. Now, remember that time where I told you about the flesher? Yeah, he's, uh, he's back and he's angrier than ever. Oh, <laughs> yeah, he's angry. In the way, boy! In the way, boy! In the way, boy! Oh, he got me. He got me. I'm dead. I'm dead in a fucking doornail. Holy shit. Bro, calm down. And at one point I was, I was right next to him and I ran into the room like a little bitch and hid in a corner. Now, when those creatures get close to you, they make your scream shake like an earthquake in Haiti. And it is honestly one of the most terrifying experiences I've ever felt in a game. One thing Soma is amazing at doing is making you feel completely helpless. There are absolutely no weapons in this game and all you can do when you encounter enemies is run and hide. I was sure that I would die right here, but he eventually decided to go away. After finding the vessel and entering your Omni tool, Catherine tells you that there is something preventing the vessel from being powered. So of fucking course, Simon has to yet again explore to fix the issue. After avoiding big scary light bulb head man, you end up in a room where the WoW have taken over the reactor power with their tentacle robot bungholes. After ripping out the third one, it knocks you to the ground and one of the fleshers appear right in front of you, beginning a short chase scene in which you need to get back to the escape vessel. And trust me, it is, it is very easy to fuck up right here. Get the hell out of here. Get the Sam hell out of here. Exactly! Exactly, Catherine, Karen, Catherine. Remember when I said that whenever you start to progress to a new area and get things working, everything just goes wrong? Well, it happens here too. For whatever fucking reason, the vessel ends up crashing, knocking Simon out once again. This is 
this is kind of really the only thing I don't like about this game. Like these kind of like adventure leaps are kind of predictable, but it, it's such a minor thing about the game. I can't really complain about it at all. And I get why the developers do it too, because you're, you're you're kind of going from one area to the next, and they don't really want you like backtracking. So it's it, it's important for a story based game, but it's it's just that it's predictable. <laughs> Camera rolling? Okay. Can you tell me your name? Pulaski, Adam. And what is your function? Function? Chief Engineer at Kron. I support the bio guys. Marital status? I was married. How tall are you? 180 centimeters. Really? Tell me, what position are you in just now? Position? What do you mean position? Standing, sitting, laying down. Position. I'm on the floor. Can you stand for me, please? I guess, yeah. Well? Well, what? You want it standing and I'm standing. Oh, okay then. Could you describe the view from up there? I'm sitting and curious. I don't know what you want from me. I just want you to tell me exactly what... It's just what like what you see, but higher and from the opposite direction, okay? What is this? 180 centimeters is a fair height. Can you... Tell me how many paper clips are on this table? No, that's not correct. Uh, three. I missed that one. That's not right either. Well, why not you come down here and tell me how many you can see? Down here? But you're standing. You said I that. I never you're... said that. No. Okay. Can you stand then and tell me? I don't feel like it. Why not? Because you're being a fucking asshole. That's why not. No need to get upset. You think this is upset? Do you want to see me upset? Okay. Let's try something else. Yeah, you better fucking leave! So what, do I just start talking to it? Yeah. Have a seat. Start when you're comfortable. Uh, hey there. How are you? What the... This is incredible. We look so much alike. I'm looking into a mirror right now. Yeah. Yeah, if you say so. What's your designation? My name's Adam Golaski. That's what you wanted, right? My name. What's your designation? Chief Engineer Adam Golaski. This is some sort of joke, right? Some sort of jape? I'm not your man for this kind of game. Funny, I was just about to say the same thing. So, I'm supposed to believe that you're me? No. And when's my birthday? You know what? When's my daughter's birthday? October 16th. Wait, who the fuck are you to ask about my daughter? Adam Golaski. Adam Golaski, the busted tape deck. How about this? Why don't you tell me something? Hmm? Oh, this ought to be a prize. What were Dad's last words? Are you serious? You're bringing up my father's death right now. That's off the rails, man. Nobody knows about this. That it even happened. And this is something you can't just pull from the frame. I think maybe we could do this another time. Try changing the subject. Challenge his experiences in relation to his no, body. No, I'm not. His... I'm not doing this. I'm sorry, but I'm not doing this. Enough. After a while, Simon wakes up from the crash. 
Luckily, your floating little buddy comes to the rescue and cuts open the door for you so you can escape the crash vessel. Absolutely perfect timing for a little buddy to help us out. Now, just like every other time the game has halted our progress, we have to move forward and find our way to Theta. After a little bit of wandering around, you end up at the Delta Station where there are multiple different areas to discover. The first pod I found, I was greeted with a very large puddle of blood in what appears to be an office of sorts. And sitting in the puddle of blood are two detached fucking eyeballs. Yes, two detached eyeballs. This little piece of knowledge is is really important for a future event, so jot this down in the old memory. She say one I wanna haul up there in the dang noggin there, boy. Remember to keep that one keep that one alive. A note is also scratched on the walls that reads, the light is hurting my eyes. He's telling me I don't need this vitreous flesh inside my skull to see salvation. I will gladly remove them. Stop them from obfuscating this divine mission. This also being a very important foreshadow of what's to come. There's also another note on the desk stating that whoever was in this office is happy that the WoW is taking over Delta. Very clearly that whoever wrote this has gone far, far, far off the deep end. Once you head back outside, a worker bot appears that is not hostile towards you at all. It has very clearly had a brain scan uploaded to it though, because it will talk to you in short, unimportant sentences. I think I need some vacation soon. I have to speak with Akers about that. Isn't that right, Akers? After a bit of exploration, you end up in a room where there is a person that you can data mine, and you can hear them talking about somebody named Akers, who has gone mad and is heading towards Theta. Come in, Strasky. Can you hear me? Theta, listen. Akers is headed for Theta. Akers is the person that was in the pod we were just in who ripped his eyeballs out. For some odd reason, Akers wanted the WoW to take over, as made very clear by the note in his office. After walking back to the Delta area, you will eventually find a Zeppelin station in which you need to use a signal channeling thingy to retrieve a transport so you can get to Theta. After the Zeppelin lands, you put in the Omni tool in it and Catherine tells you that you need a new tool chip that apparently got busted during the crash. Now this is probably the coolest part of the game, because it's the first and only time you actually get to use a weapon. I know I said before there's new weapons in Gale to say, oh now there's weapons, now there's weapons. Hey, it's, it's kind of a weapon. In a chest on the Zeppelin there is a stun gun of sorts that you need to use to basically kill a robot to harvest its tool chip. And you bet your sweet fucking ass that I am not killing my little buddy Frank Jr. By the way, that's what I named him. I named him Frank Jr. I'm killing that dumbass robot who doesn't listen to you and just barks orders around. And si Simon feels bad for it, but personally, I could get two shits. So after inserting the new tool chip, we head off to the illustrious Theta. And surprisingly enough, nothing happens on the way there. This part really shocked me after the constant crashing from one place to the other. It's just a, it's just a smooth ride with uh, nothing freaky and no crashes. Although Catherine uh, finds this a great time to blabber on about the mission and gets annoyed with Simon because he's being so silent. He starts having an existential crisis about his uh, certain situation and how it's weird for him that he knows that he's not a person anymore but his mind makes him feel like he still is. Catherine puts it really well here, so I'm just gonna let her describe it. I just can't stop thinking about what we've become. It's clear that we're no longer human. But then how can I feel like Simon? How can I feel like anything at all? I mean, technically, I don't have any ears, no mouth. Christ, that's a weird thing to think about. I mean, I'm making sounds. I'm still saying things. You sure are. <sighs> okay. Your new body most likely has senses similar to those you had as a human. And your mind, only knowing one way to perceive the world, superimposes that skill set on top of your new features. So my mind is covering it up, pretending nothing's different. If it didn't, you'd probably be incapable of interacting with the world at all. And the stress would either kill you or make you go insane. So I've found a good balance between awareness and ignorance. Does that mean I shouldn't think about this stuff, or are my thoughts actually making me cool? Could I tip the balance by suddenly gaining some insight and then go insane? I wouldn't worry about it. I mean, we have real things to deal with. Saving mankind, remember? After landing at the cargo site, the conversation wraps up and Simon heads on his way entering Theta. Now for this part, you might want to go get some tissues or a handkerchief or something, because this is probably one of, if not the most sad parts of the game. Upon finding the entrance to Theta, you notice a robot that has been taken over by the WoW laying on the floor. You talk to her and find out that her name is Robin Bass, a service technician that worked at Theta. Simon asks her how she got there and she exclaims to you that she got her brain scanned and that she killed herself. Then explains to you that when you get scanned, 
there are basically two of you. One of you that's scanned in the Ark system, and one living human that's you. And the sad part about this whole thing is that she thinks that this specific scan is her being on the Ark. But she doesn't realize that the WoW took her brain scan and uploaded it to this random work robot. She is fully aware that she is currently on the Ark right now. Which is, you know, supposed to be an oasis, not a dark ocean. After the whole conversation stops, you are given the conscious decision to pull the plug from her, ending her quote-unquote life. This wasn't super hard for me because I've already done this multiple times, and I've already stood that ending their misery is better than just leaving them there to spend eternity hooked up to the corruption that is the WoW. The game does a really good job at making you feel sad though, by having the robots scream in fucking agony when you pull the plug, and then there's, you know, the somber music really. It just makes you feel sad. You definitely feel like you've, you've just taken somebody's life, even though they don't really understand that it's you putting them out of their misery. So after that sad little event, you eventually open the doors to Theta. After doing a little smashy smashy on a window, you end up in a room where you can enter Catherine to a console to progress. In this room, there is supposed to be the Dunbat that will help us get to the bottom of the ocean. But it is in a... It's in a quarantine. Catherine opens the other doors in the corridor to let you investigate. Oh, what fun it is to investigate in this game. After entering one of the two doors and climbing down some scaffolding, you can hear the absolute most horrifying, agonizing yells of something, something below. Oh lord, maybe I should have chose the hallway. The kind of screams that would make you want to slap your grandpappy. Now my pussy ass decided to go back and check the other room, which was way more pleasant. Until this happened. Oh my god! Yeah, this uh, <laughs> this game this game will get you sometimes. So after turning around like a little bitch, I discovered a room where brain scans took place. And the coolest part about this room is this is where the brain scans of you are. Simon Jarrett's scan. And the reason that Simon's scan is here is because when you first went to get your brain scan, Dr. Munchie asked you if you're willing to let him use your scan for research purposes. You can also see here on the screen that Simon died a month after the scan. And the current Simon doesn't remember anything about that because the scan was only his memory up until the point that he got scanned. So anything that human Simon experienced after that, he doesn't remember. There are a few audio recordings from human Simon that I'm just gonna let play right now. Okay, that's it. Wow, that was fun. That's a relief. Still figuring this out, so. This freaky, so many lights. What do we do now? Paul and I are gonna run tests for a week or so, and then we'll work out a roadmap to your recovery. Well, I feel excited. Can't wait to get back to the living. We've worked everything out. Everything is legal. Vouched for by Dr. Peak and Professor Wei. Oh, that's great news. No big change in medication. You'll be taking an aspirin every morning, but that's about it. Paul worked out a diet with some variations you should try out. You can continue doing physical therapy. Also, there's some extra cardio training every other day. Okay, getting complicated. Don't worry, it's really not. We're gonna keep an eye on you every week, so we'll be able to adjust the plan if needed. The model was sound. It should have worked. It's not your fault, David. I really wish things had turned out differently. Yeah, me too. I was supposed to save you. Hey, you got my brain on file. Maybe you can put it to some use. <laughs> yeah, who knows? You'd be okay with that? Using it for my research? Sure. It's like a part of me lives on or something. Like a donated organ. You know what sucks about dying? What? The crash. Everything up till now. The brain damage. You guys, everything. It's made my life so much more real. I started thinking about all the things I was going to do. I'd never been more excited to be alive. All that hope. Wasted. Pretty crazy for current Simon to have to hear himself in his last dying hour, and it's something that he doesn't remember at all. 
I don't know, man. Moments like this in the game really trip me up and make me think what it is to actually be real and what it is to be alive. You can also choose to erase these brain scans afterwards too, which I chose to do so because the entire reason that we're in this mess is because the WoW found Simon's brain scan and decided to randomly upload it to a host body, which is what we're currently in. Which now makes me think that there might there might be other Simons out there right now. Like there could easily be a Simon that's just in the same position as Robin Bass was. Just attached to the WoW on the floor, having no idea what's going on, not being able to move, and spending eternity just existing and stuck. And in my opinion, that's very terrifying to think about. <laughs> After searching around a bit, you end up in a room with a computer that has these little stations that you can insert brain scans into. On the side of the room, there's an area where you can grab the brain scans, but 95% of them have been destroyed from what almost seemingly looks like they've been lit on fire. It almost seems like one of the workers maybe knew that the WoW was using random brain scans to upload to random and various different robots, but this isn't really discussed anywhere, so this is I'm kind of just talking out of the side of my head. Anyways, this room is extremely important for the progression of the game, but right now, there's a connection area on all the computers so guess fucking what i i have to go into that scary ass hallway room with the fucking screams of the damned yeah, of course of course i have to go there but first let's go into the living quarters and snoop through everyone's shit Now, a lot of these rooms are, they're not really that important, but eventually you end up in Catherine's room where you find one of her bras. Yeah, the boulder holders. Just look at this bra. Catherine, she looks like she has some like 32 C's or some shit. Anyways, uh, back to the game. After a brief moment of being an immature idiot, you find a digital notebook with Catherine's notes where she explains that the WoW created and copied an alternate reality capsule or the ARC that we discussed earlier and made the scans in the capsule better than Catherine's scans would and that Catherine ended up taking the idea from the wow and creating her own ar capsule at being the arc and this is where simon finds out that the wow has been stealing brain scans for its own purpose after leaving Catherine's room you end up at the room of mark serang and who is mark serang you might ask and why the hell is he important enough to talk about in this video well sit your ass down and let me explain it to you mark serang was a korean reconnaissance professional employed by cartage industries after perusing around mark's belongings you eventually find a note that explains that Mark Serang killed himself. And this note reads, Dear friends, when you read this, I will have entered the Ark. As I've explained, this is accomplished by ceasing to live as your scan is being completed. To not frighten Catherine, I will do this in secret by folding cyanide salts into chewing gum and placing it in my mouth before seeing her. When I hear her announce completion, I will bite down, quickly causing my own demise. When you discover the truth behind my death, know there's no tragedy to mourn, for I am victorious. I advise you all to do the same and join me inside the Ark. Sincerely, Mark Serang. So Mark decided to commit suicide almost immediately after he had his brain scan. And he had also proposed this continuity belief that widely affected the art project and diluted multiple Theta personnel. Now what the continuity theory suggests is that after being scanned during a short moment, the original consciousness and the copy, i.e. the scan, are identical, but will soon become two distinct entities due to diverging experiences. The proposed method to counter this is to end the previous original existence during or quickly after the scanning procedure, as this will cause the original to cease experiencing the real world, but leave behind an identical copy that will be ready to explore the virtual world of the Ark. Many crew members misinterpreted this theory and believed that the original consciousness could transfer onto the Ark if the physical body died. This led to many, many suicides shortly after the scans. John Strohmeyer, the security operative on Pathos 2, and others attempted to learn why this occurred, forcefully entering Mark Serang's room in Theta in violation of Cartage Industries company policy. Serang's continuity belief spread at Pathos 2 and was soon adopted by other like-minded people who committed suicide after their scan. After six suicides, John Strohmeyer put the art project on hold indefinitely. You do end up finding Robin Bass's room though. Robin Bass being the robot that was outside of Theta that we uh, unplugged and killed. And her bed is covered in blood with a blade on the bed, indicating that she also believed the same continuity theory that Mark Serang believed, taking her own life shortly after her scan. But for monetization purposes, I, I can't show that on YouTube. YouTube. Just gotta use your imagination here. After heading back out of the living area, the game decided to pull this shit again. I feel like the wolf. Bastard. Fucking light got me twice. Yes, they really did that to me again. And it got me. Uh, 
again. Anyways, so at this point, I had completely forgotten about the other room with the demon screamer in it, and that it's somewhere I have to go. So after making my way downtown, walking fast faces past, and I'm homebound, once you get into this room, there's an enemy known as the proxy. A proxy is an employee that has been completely mutated by Structure Joe. I just want you to take a gander at this gnarly bastard. I want you to imagine seeing that in your room at 3 a.m. making these noises. <laughs> Like, fuck no, dude. Like, no, like, absolutely no way, no, just no. But luckily, though, these monsters, they're blind. They can't see a damn thing. But they do have very acute hearing. So, kind of basically like an eyeless dog from Lethal Company. Now, while you are down in the server room, you can avoid the proxy by picking up random things and throwing them in the opposite direction for where you need to go. This will cause the proxy to chase after the noise to figure out what the hell's going on. And as absolutely terrifying as this part of the game is, it's fairly easy once you understand how it functions. But if you've never played the game before and you've never seen this video before, you wouldn't really know that. One thing about this game is it, uh, it definitely never holds your hand through anything, but that just makes it all the more fun to play. Now, after turning the network back on in the server room, you go back into the room where Catherine is and she tells you that you need to run a simulation with the chip that you found in the brain scan area to attempt to find the cipher code for the Dunbat. After scrolling through a few names, you end up using the brain scan of Brandon Wong, somebody that worked with John Strohmeyer, the security operative of Pathos 2. After starting the simulation, you see Juan put in several different locations and you attempt to ask him what the cipher code is But he knows that something is up and gets overly stressed eventually making the simulation fail Catherine eventually guides you to check out Juan's room out in the living quarters to find out more information about him That we can use to gain his trust you find out in the room that he did his scan with somebody named Alice Who appears to be either his girlfriend or just somebody that he really trusted after heading back to the simulation room Catherine has made it so with this specific simulation run she will be able to talk in Alice his voice, getting him to calm down and build more trust, eventually leading him to tell us the cipher code. Stromar really got me worked up, bastard. Well, that's what you get for listening to his stories. I guess I had it coming. About Stromar, he's sending you to the new cipher ASAP. What should I tell him? It's all right. I can talk to him. Wait, didn't Sean just tell you to take it easy? Don't worry, I'm not going to tell anyone. I do feel hungover. Okay. It's 1729 over 42, 12 over 407. Got it? Yeah, I got it. I'm sorry, Mr. Long. Brandon. Goodbye. No, wait. That's enough. We got what we need. Is that what we are? Simulations? Yeah, but it shouldn't make any difference. You're still you. I'm not sure what to do with the data. You decide. And after that, it gives you the option to erase his data. And of course, you know what I chose. Goodbye, Brandon. Now, once you make your way back to the Dunbat room, Catherine is able to take control over the quarantine that the Dunbat is under. Now, if you're wondering what the hell is a Dunbat, a Dunbat is a medium-sized submersible vessel that is made to endure the overwhelming pressure of the abyss, allowing it to be used for deep sea exploration. It is said to be so well-structured that it could even be capable of reaching depths such as that of the Mariana Trench. Unfortunately, a massive structure structure gel leak caused the WoW to seize control over the Dunbat, forcing it to undergo quarantine procedures to avoid further development. Catherine tells you that you need to enter the room and take her with you so that you can enter the Dunbat and make the plunge to the abyss of the ocean. After turning on the power at the podium, the claws reach down to grab the Dunbat so Simon can enter it. And what do you know, the Dunbat has been taken over by the WoW. It starts freaking out and screaming and rips itself away from the claws and falls back into the water. And for some reason, this completely knocks Simon out. Only only to wake back up in a completely dark, quiet room. After searching around for a little bit, you find a ladder that you use to climb into the vents, and you find yourself in a new room with a fresh butthole to give you some heals. Since Simon gets knocked out every 30 minutes, they need to keep placing random buttholes everywhere so he can feel better and fix his little ouchie wouchies. After finding a console, you plug Catherine in and you give her the bad news. She explains that the only other way to get to the ocean floor is to head to Omicron and take a power suit down. The power suit being a heavily armored, deep sea diving suit 
Bandit, manufactured by Hamatsu Technologies, which pretty much serves the same purpose as the Dunbat did. In this current room that you're in, Catherine notices that there's an arc simulation, and she tells you to look around and find more information on the arc. After walking around a little bit in this room, you find a big tube-shaped scanner that you can enter. During this scan, Catherine tells you that you seem to be one with the suit that you're in, and that everything is meshed together. And this confuses Simon on how he's going to be able to get into the power suit at Omicron. And this is where Catherine tells you a big fat lie. Interesting. You seem to be one with the diving suit you're wearing. Everything's meshed together. How's that going to work with the suit we're picking up at Omicron? Um, I think they're bigger. You should be able to wear them both. And I won't tell you why she's lying about that, but you will learn in the near future. You also learn that the body that you're in is that of one of Catherine's old colleagues, Imogen Reed. Her position being that she was assigned to examine the Vivarium device. The Vivarium being the machine that the WoW based on Catherine Chun's early stage art project, which in turn served as a template for the art project and officially established the project. But Reed eventually discovered a scan of herself located in the Vivarium. And that's because Catherine had used a scan of Reed in her early stage art project. So eventually ended up in the vivarium. Now Reed and Chun had many disagreements regarding the ARC project and the usage of the brain scan copies. Reed had strongly believed that the WoW was manipulating them and that the copies were mere fakes. Unfortunately the scan of Reed was corrupted due to a complication during the scan process where Reed had suffered a seizure that Chun suspected had caused some mental trauma. Reed then refused to provide a second scan and believed that was the reason why she relocated to Site Lambda as a member of the Lambda salvage crew to salvage supplies. Now in this little scan you also find out that you actually have a cortex chip in your brain. The cortex chip being the thing that we used to put Catherine in our Omni tool. So she has her own cortex chip. We have our own cortex chip. You put two and two together. Yeah, yeah, you'll get it. And by finding this out, Catherine is excited to let you know that you can be uploaded to the art project yourself. And she also makes it a point that because your mind was not uploaded to a robot, but a actual person, a human body within a tech suit, kind of gives you the best of both worlds. Because the wow trying to revive a dead body usually results in the horrific monstrosities around Soma and uploading a scan to a random robot just kind of makes them useless. So you're kind of like the best of both worlds. Now here's where things get really spicy. And by spicy, I mean absolutely terrifying. After passing through the quarantine drawers, you enter uh, what seems to be a normal looking area, but you can hear something smashing around and making horrific screeching noises. Okay, that's not good. To your immediate left, there is a data buffer where you can hear Brandon Wan, the guy that we use in the simulation to get the cipher code for the Dunbat, talking to John Strohmeyer, telling him that Akers has lost it and that he's probably not going to survive. You can actually hear Akers on the data buffer, screeching in the background as well. Strohmeyer, Brandon, where are you? You got out of hand. I'm in sector RD4. Did you get everyone downstairs? Yeah, we're safe for now, but you need to get moving. They're going to figure out where we are and come for us. Don't worry about it. The stairs are blocked, and I killed the elevator. Pull the connector chip from the lock. Why? That means you're stuck as well. Only way to keep you guys safe. Take the shuttle, go to Omicron. God damn it, Juan. You just had to be the hero, you bastard. Good luck, sir. Tell Alice I love her. Now, you might remember the name Akers, as he is the one that went off the deep end at Delta, the place where we took that Zeppelin and had to kill that one robot, and ripped his eyes out and praised the WoW for taking over, and came to Theta to wreak havoc. Terry Akers was the chief factor at Site Delta and Pathos 2, and him being the chief factor, he was basically the head manager of each respective site on Pathos 2. So he was kind of a head honcho before the WoW kind of took him over. Now, not much is really known about Akers' past other than he is an older man whose accent indicates that he would be from what is today known as the southern United States. I've changed my mind. I would like to come to Theta. Let Delta sleep. He is one of the oldest people at Delta, if not the entirety of Pathos 2, being 66 years old. And while Akers is never really seen in his human form, both light and dark skin can be seen on his mutated form, which give an idea of what a skin tone could have been. He seemed to have a stable working relationship with the Delta crew, with them usually respecting him due to his age and position. Fearing the growing threat of the WoW and the site's general state of deterioration, the rest of the site's crew relocated to Theta. After being told by Dorian Kronstadt, the administrative supervisor at Pathos 2, that he could not keep his position as 
chief factor, Akers willingly stayed behind. Sometime during the period of isolation that followed, he began ingesting large amounts of structure gel, undergoing a brief period of reconstruction and plummeting into insanity. In one intense psychotic episode, Akers heard a voice telling him that he did not need his eyes to see anymore. This voice, coupled with a gel-induced light sensitivity, convinced him to remove his own eyes, which is what we saw back when we were at Delta. Four or five months later, Akers called Theta and said that he wanted to relocate back to Theta just like his crew members did. And after they had sent a Zeppelin for him to relocate, Akers ambushed them, overpowering the entire party and cutting off their communications before they could warn Theta. He injected the fatally wounded divers with structure gel and escaped using the Zeppelin they arrived at. Theta's crew later spotted the Zeppelin near their complex. Finding Akers disfigured and comatose within the vessel, they unwittingly brought him to the site's medical ward. The on-site doctor took several scans and performed an examination and started writing a report in her office, declaring that due to heavy mutation and gel infestation ravaging through his body, he was unlikely to ever awaken. Akers then rose from the examination table and bashed in her skull before she finished. Simon later finds her body slumped in her chair, kept artificially alive by the structure gel. And after all this happened, and the crew realizing that they were no match for Akers, they decided to evacuate the remaining staff to Omicron. Now this area is its kind of almost like the boss fight of the game, in a, in a way. But once you understand how Akers works, it's, it's really not like, it's not super hard. I mean, we're playing Soma here, we're not playing Dark Souls. But when I was streaming this, I was completely blind on how he navigated, and I actually ended up dying one time and getting stuck a few times. Speaking of blind, remember how I said that Akers ripped his eyes out in Delta? Yeah, well, the WoW never gave him his eyes back, and this game was created long before Mr. Beast was around, so no luck for Mr. Akers. Basically, he is very, very, very sensitive to sound, so much so that you pretty much have to crouch around constantly in order to not alert him. And he is so, so sensitive to sound that he can also hear you turning on and off your flashlight. So when you're playing, you have to be wary of that too. But if you do get too close to him, he will base he will just, he will sense you like a fucking Jedi or something, which is what happened in this situation right here. Oh, this is fucking my world up. This is fucking my world up. Right after I got the bubble health. Can you leave, sir? Ain't no way. Ain't no way. Are you fucking kidding me? Now, the first time you get hit by him, he will just knock you the fuck out and cut your health in half. And when you come to, he will be gone. Now, you will be able to stumble around, but if you get hit again, you're fucking dead and I don't know what to tell you. Now, unlike most other enemies, Akers has a special hiding state that activates whenever he's out of Simon's sight. In this hiding state, Akers will quietly stalk Salmon. Salmon? I cannot believe I just called him fucking Salmon. Akers will quietly stalk Simon throughout the Theta Labs, only occasionally making sounds to hint of his presence, such as distant footsteps and his annoying groans. And Akers, he cannot attack in this hiding state at all. He will only exit his hiding state if any of the following conditions are met. If Simon makes a sound that Akers can hear, this includes actions such as running, jumping, using a wow node, or breaking the glass near Brandon Wan's body. When repairing the elevator, moving each clamp will also be loud enough to alert Akers. However, walking, crouching, and toggling the flashlight are quiet enough to not alert Akers while he's hiding. Throwing objects around won't alert Akers until Simon has smashed the glass at least once, at which point Akers will grow wary and start hiding closer to Simon to try and catch him throwing objects around. He will also exit his hiding state if too much time has passed. This depends on which stage Simon is at while recovering and repairing the connector chip. If he has just entered the area, then it takes about five minutes for Akers to reappear. If Simon has taken the chip from Brandon Wan, then it takes 82 seconds, and if he puts the new cipher on the chip, then Akers reappears in only 54 seconds. And then also after Simon enters the elevator, Akers will appear regardless of whatever else Simon is doing and will immediately give chase in a last ditch attempt to stop him. So get your ass in that fucking elevator. Now after going in and out of a ton of pointless rooms, you end up in John Strohmeyer's office, where on his computer you can override the door locks in any room in the area that you're in. Now this part was extremely stressful because no matter what you do, Akers always seems to be hanging around this office. So trying to escape is very hard. According to the game files, Akers Akers AI is capable of dynamically enabling the bad hearing value, which controls from how far he is able to detect sounds from him. This value is normally never enabled for enemies outside of the safe mode, but Akers' bad hearing value is set to true whenever Simon is in Strohmeyer's office, which is kind of the reason why when you're in his office, Akers never seems to go away, he just wanders around the office. Now this makes 
any sound made by Simon or thrown objects travel only a third of the distance as normal. The bad hearing value will be set back to false after exiting the room, making Simon's sound travel the normal distance. Eventually, after enough time has passed, he will walk into the lab area right next to Strohmeyer's office and you're able to override the doors and lock him in there. But before that, let's show the part where I thought that he was locked in and it turned out he was just standing right there around the corner. <gasps> How did it go right there? That doesn't make us no sense. That doesn't make it no sense, that boy. Oh God, oh no, oh, oh, put your fucking chip in. Oh my fucking Lord. Oh Jesus. My actual heart is beating like crazy right now. Now, after you finally escape, you end up back in the elevator and lo and behold, it breaks while you're going down and you go plummeting towards earth and get your ass knocked out. I know, shocker. After regaining consciousness, you go into this lower area where there's just a ton of bloody, nasty goo all over the walls. And this goo is called the mine corals. Now the mine coral is a red organic substance found at Delta and Theta. Various dead or comatose bodies are frequently found engulfed in it and it's visible on the bodies of Terry Akers and the proxies but it actually goes nameless in the final release of Soma. You can only find out about this information by going through the game files itself. In an earlier version of the game, the Mind Coral was set to play much more of a role in the story and was one of the reasons why things went to hell at Theta. The game files also refer to Hive Coral and Hive Mind in reference to the Mind Coral, though it is unknown if it was meant to be an extension of the WoW or something entirely separate. Apparently Simon would not just have found bodies stuck in the Mind Coral, but also bodies that had actually become a part of it, with random body parts sticking out of the entire corridor of the living flesh, all dripping various bodily fluids. There are also descriptions of Simon finding conscious victims encased within the mine coral, who become agitated when he shines his flashlight on them. And at one point, Simon would even have had this progress blocked by a coral victim with a male head, but body parts from multiple different donors of differing genders and ethnicities, the resulting creature apparently having a resemblance to Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man. But this is all behind the scenes stuff that never really got introduced into the final release. So unfortunately, we don't really have any kind of like physical art or any anything that would show this. My best guess is that maybe it was a little bit too gory for this game, or that it might take away from the importance of the WoW, but that's just my interpretation. After Simon travels through the walls of bloody goo, you open a door and walk down a hallway, only to be met by Akers again chasing you down the hallway. He again knocks you absolutely the fuck out, and the screen goes dark, having Simon wake up and he's back in his apartment. You hear a womanly voice telling you that it's over now and it's time to relax. Don't move. It's okay. What? It's over now. Relax. You look over to your right and it's Ashley, Simon's girlfriend that died in the car crash at the beginning of the game. Now it doesn't take a monkey smashing two rocks together to figure out that this is just a hallucination and Simon needs to wake the hell up. And he does. After coming to, he realizes that Akers has connected him to the bloody mess on the walls that also connects him to the WoW, which was making him dream that. After pulling himself away from the bloody mess and trekking around for a while, you eventually get to a point where you have to turn a generator on while also avoiding Akers the entire time, which is fairly easy. It's kind of tedious though, you just have to make sure to crouch around and not make too much noise. Basically, just like we did back at Theta. It leads you to an area where I can only describe as a water monster area, but there is no water monster. Thank God. I just feel like these kinds of areas exist in games or movies. And there's always some kind of like, like water monster in this area. I don't know why this area just gives me that vibe. Anyways, you have to climb a series of ladders and land on platforms to get to the room in which you can use a handle to flush the water out. And after stepping out of the room, there's fucking oh, acres oh bitch God. ass again. Like, go away, dude. Holy shit. I don't want to buy any fucking Girl Scout cookies. After sprinting away from him, you get hit by the water flushing out into the ocean, which finally gets you out of Theta. And all I can say is I was never happier to be back in the openness of the ocean until now. Luckily, Akers is never seen again after this scene, as he was likely killed when the tunnel was flushed, as revealed by cut content where Simon was going to see his corpse after waking up outside of Omicron. <laughs> After walking for a bit, you end up in one of those little pods outside of Omicron where you can plug Catherine back in. She tells you that her powers are restricted in that area and that you have to go basically do an Among Us puzzle to get the power back on for that specific pod. Simon decides to start questioning her on how she feels about being a person without a body and that it makes her feel a little self-conscious. Simon also asks her why she thinks that the WoW brought him here and she explains that the WoW's main goal is to preserve human life and that when the comet hit Earth and wiped out most of 
humanity, the WoW overcompensated, which is basically why all of these horrific monstrosities even exist and why Simon is where he is today. She also explains that the WoW doesn't really understand what human life really is though, which is why it's mostly just taking random brain scans and putting it into robot bodies or using the structure gel to take over biological beings. When you first walk into this area, there is a body kneeling down with a big giant hole missing from its head and you attempt to data mine it, but it makes no sound. This is how Simon discovers that every employee at Pathos 2 had what's called a black box in their head, which was used to record vitals and whatnot. And that's why he's able to data mine these random bodies and be able to hear their last moments, unless their black box overheated and exploded, which resulted in them dying, obviously. And throughout Soma, you will sometimes find dead people on the floor completely missing their head. And this is exactly why. Using the console, you find out that you need a code in order to uplift the quarantine for Omicron so that you can enter it. And after searching the room, you find another console and one of the options basically spams you with the code, which in turn makes Simon feel like someone is like someone is luring him. Why do I get the feeling that we just got lured into the back of a van? What are you talking about? Which is a, a tad bit of foreshadowing, but you'll eventually find out why. After uplifting the quarantine to Omicron, you head out and make your way there. Upon opening the door, you try to use your Omni tool and there's of course another malfunction. So you have to trek through the side in which you eventually find an emergency access door. This area is incredibly dark and you have to find a way to turn the power back on. Boy, am I really getting tired of turning the power on everywhere. There are a certain amount of things about this game that get really repetitive but luckily the story is just so damn good that it still makes the progression interesting now once you get inside this building you eventually make it into a room and simon's brain glitchy vision thing starts going crazy and he hears a voice calling out to him telling him to stop it now the voice that you are hearing is that of neuroscientist dr johan ross he served as the ai psychologist on pathos 2 stationed at tau which is a location that we will go to in the future and his sole purpose was to work at the covert site alpha as the overseer and the operator of the wow so this dude really knows what's going on with the wow luckily there are some pictures of his human form which you eventually find in the infirmary room at the tau which again is the site that we will visit in the future but in his mutated form dr ross is a gaunt top heavy creature with a jaunting gait and thin tentacles pouring from his mouth now his behavior is unusual for a wow affected being as in the fact that he is not at all hostile towards simon and he appears to retain his character and a semblance of of human sanity, which is almost unheard of, especially after all of the WoW creatures we've encountered so far. Throughout the progression of the rest of the game, Dr. Ross will give cryptic messages and warnings to Simon. Now, having been involved in the development of the WoW, Dr. Ross witnessed its mutations and came to the conclusion that the WoW needs to be terminated. In addition to the fact that it was causing pipes to burst structure gel all throughout Pathos 2, he stated that though the WoW has humanity's survival at its highest priority, it has no understanding of what humanity actually is. Is. Its attempts to preserve human life created the proxies, which is that weird bubbly monster we found down in the server room, and technically what Terry Akers really is. Also, its many attempts to preserve human minds, creating the mockingbirds, i.e. the random robots with just random minds uploaded to it, meaning that if it was not destroyed, it would subject humanity's last survivors to endless suffering, which is basically what we've already encountered throughout the game so far. After the impact event, Dr. Ross joined his colleagues at Tau. He remained there until Vic Auclair, crazy ass name, ordered the staff at Tau to evacuate and move the climber rig up to Omicron, which if you don't know what the hell a climber rig is, we will retackle that topic in the near future. I just want to make sure you guys understand the absolute importance of Dr. Johan Ross. And during the evacuation, the Tau staff were attacked by structure gel mutated marine life, resulting in loss of radio contact with Omicron. After failing to reach the climber and losing a number of colleagues, the remaining members of Tau, including Dr. Ross, returned to the facility and were left stranded there. Unfortunately, while trying to warn site alpha about the wow they were attacked by the mutated wildlife with only dr ross making it to the climber albeit heavily injured when omicron later recalled the climber per schedule they discovered the comatose body of dr ross the doctor's critically damaged body was placed in omicron's central containment cell which is what this little kind of empty glass room is shortly thereafter the omicron staff experienced anomalous phenomena around the containment room as well as system failures and excruciatingly painful black box interference the black box being the thing that's in everybody's head. Unknown to the staff, this was a side effect of the WoW exerting control over electromagnetic fields in order to heal and resuscitate Dr. Ross through the structure gel inside of his body. At some point during his healing mutation, Dr. Ross gained telepathic abilities, which he used to speak 
to the human personnel, possibly and most likely through their black boxes. Rally Herber, Omicron's dispatcher, was the only employee to believe the doctor's story about the WoW, Site Alpha, and his plan to destroy it. As Dr. Ross later recounted to Simon at Site Alpha, quoting, she was going to take care of it, but the WoW shrieked. What he means by the WoW shrieked was the WoW sending the most intense surge of electromagnetic energy yet, overloading the black boxes of all the staff at Omicron, causing their heads to explode. Now, after exploring around Omicron, you end up in a room where you can plug Catherine in and she explains to you that you need to find a power suit that will get you to the bottom of the ocean. Basically plan B because the Dunbat sucked. Fuck you Dunbat. She tells Simon that he will essentially transfer his mind to the new suit, just like how his scan from Toronto ended up in his current body. And oh man, when Simon finds this shit out, he is not happy at all. It is a big deal, Kath. It's a huge fucking deal. There's gotta be something else that can take us down there. The Dunbat at Theta was the only vessel that could take that pressure and you saw what happened. Then think of something else. I don't know if you remember, but back at Theta, I told you that Catherine just basically tells Simon a big fat lie, telling him that the power suit will be bigger than his current suit and that he can just get inside of it. Basically what Catherine is doing and the reason she's lying is because she knows that Simon is very, he, he's, he's emotional. He's very emotionally driven and doesn't really accept the logical parts of things for the most part. Because she knew if she told him back at Theta that his mind is going to transfer over to a new body and his old body is just going to be left there, he probably wouldn't progress the mission. But understanding that there is no other way to get the Ark to space, he reluctantly agrees. Upon finding the power suit, it is missing parts that Catherine tells you that you need to retrieve. And this part, eh, it's, a it's a tad mundane because you basically just have to run around Omicron looking for pieces to a puzzle while Johan Ross randomly telepathically tells you to stop the WoW. Now there is, there is one enemy here, apparently called Robot Head, which really isn't a very good name. And it's basically just a woman that stands there and cries. And I know what you're thinking here. I'm not gonna make the joke, but just, just know that I know that you know. And as long as you don't provoke her, i.e. throw things at her or like sprint around, she really won't do anything. You do, however, have to retrieve the battery pack that's in the same room that she's in. But if you just crouch around, you can easily grab it and then just leave the room. Like I said, she's not really much of a threat. Eventually, you stumble into a room, which appears to be the area where they tested out the effects of the structure gel on electronics and biological life. In this little room, there's a little mechanism you can use to where you can basically apply structure gel to a deadened computer chip that clearly shows that it basically becomes powered. And on the far right, there's a dead rat. And when you apply the same structure gel, the rat becomes reanimated, which I mean, we already know this knowledge by now. We have seen many reanimated robots and biological life so far. So in this little area, we need to get access Access to the structure gel so that we can bring it back to the power suit, but the chip is malfunctioning the machine. So we take the little chip, bring it back to the little rat area, apply the structure gel. You see what we're getting at? It fixes the chip. Then we can go put it back in the machine, open it up, and then retrieve the structure gel or the power suit. Now, after wandering around for a little bit, looking for the next part for the power suit, you eventually make your way into a room where there is a mirror hanging on the wall. And upon approaching said mirror, Simon actually gets to see himself for the first time. Well, not, not really himself, Imogen Reed's body inside of a pilot suit. Now, the odd thing here is that Simon actually sees the suit and not himself, which must mean that he is fully accepted what he is. Because in other instances, like one of the main arts of this game, where the construct is looking in a mirror and sees a person, because we know so far every robot encounter we've had so far is fully unaware that they're just a brain scan uploaded to a robot. And they seem kind of oblivious to the situation that they're in. When example being Carl Simkin from the beginning of the game, who thought he was just a guy laying on the floor. But Simon sees himself in the mirror and does not see his old self. Now this isn't really discussed in the game, this is just speculation, so take it with a grain of salt. Could be totally something different, I don't know. So after making your way back to the power suit room, the crazy crying bitch from downstairs somehow makes her way upstairs. And she's pretty easy to avoid. Once you start making your way closer to the power suit room, you can hear her behind you start to sprint towards you. But once you enter the power suit room, Catherine luckily locks the door behind you. Thank you, thank you very much, Catherine. Now, after taking a little bit of a breather, after yet again avoiding death, good job, Simon, you add the necessary parts to the power suit and Catherine guides you to sit down in the scan room adjacent. 
So this is where things get really, really, really fucked up for Simon. Now, we as the audience already understands how the brain scans work in this universe. You know, there could either just be this one Simon or there could be a hundred Simons. There could be only that one Carl Simpkin or there could be a thousand Carl Simpkins. It just depends on how the WoW decides to upload brain scans to various stuff. But for some reason, Simon uh, seems to have forgotten exactly how it works. Now, after sitting in the pilot seat and getting his new scan, just like he did at the beginning of the game, he wakes up in the new power suit, which doy, that's how it works. And after he wakes up in the new power suit, he can hear the other Simon immediately talking. He asks Catherine what went wrong, not understanding that by doing what he did, he essentially just created a new Simon. Now I'll let this part play out for you so you can get the gist of how Simon feels about this. Copy completed. There must be something wrong. Can't you run a diagnosis or something? Nothing. What was that? No, I, it's just... Why was it still talking? It's the same like before. Catherine, why was he still talking? But that's how it works, you know that. What do you mean? You know it's not magic. You were copied. The sleeping Simon in the sea was copied, and now... You are here, just like Simon lived on in Toronto. God damn you, Kath. Two Simons? There can't be two Simons. What did you think would happen? That you were going to take my mind and put it into another body, like a brain transplant. I'm sorry, it wouldn't work that way. You realize how messed up this is? Please, I didn't mean to upset you. How did you expect me to react to this shit? Please stop. You're fucking disgusting. What's going to happen to him? He'll sleep for a while, a few days. And then what? Wake up in this fucking nightmare again? All alone? That's so cruel. Well, what do you want me to do with him? Make friends? Let him know that we have to leave him behind when we go into the abyss? What if... What if he didn't need to wake up? You do that? I don't know. Maybe. There. I set it up for you. Hit the switch if you want to drain his battery. He'll die within a minute. I'd rather not stay plugged in any longer. Now, this is uh, one of the hardest parts of the game, in my personal opinion. Now, we've gone through the process of taking the lives of human beings connected to the WoW and also the Mockingbird robots. And we understood at the time that we were doing them a favor by ending their misery so they don't have to spend eternity connected to the WoW thinking that everything is okay. But in this specific instance, you, you are given the option to let this Simon continue to live or turn off the power and let him die. Now, the reason this is so hard is because we've essentially we've we've been this simon the entire game this entire video we've we've been playing as as that simon right there we have not been this new power suit simon for more than a couple minutes so it's a little bit of a weird choice to knowingly kill your old self which again begs the question what is it to feel alive what is it to be human now clearly none of this is human but we're put in a position of where we just have to just kill off our old self. Now, in my personal opinion, I decided to kill the old Simon. And the reasoning for that is is just like Catherine said, he will sleep for a couple days and eventually wake up just alone and have no idea what happened, stuck in a locked room without Catherine or a power suit. And even if he manages to escape that locked room, what future does he even have? Catherine is now gone. Even if he tried to make it to the tram, that's also now gone. The power suit, which was the last ditch attempt to get to the bottom of the ocean, also now gone. And he's basically just stuck at Omicron. So me personally, I feel the only humane thing to do right here is to end the the old Simon's life, which is what I did. Now, eventually you make your way outside of the building and walk down a catwalk until you find the tram that is designed to lower yourself and your new suit to the bottom of the ocean. Now, after plugging Catherine back in, Simon and Catherine have a really deep, really profound conversation here. And I, I just want to let this part play out. And I urge you to listen to this because whatever I say, it just can't really match the emotional intensity of it. Have we figured out what happens when we die? Is that even possible? There's some kind of afterlife. Do you think my place is taken? The real me died like a hundred years ago. Is there still room for me? And what about the Simon I killed at Omicron? What do you think, Catherine? Is there a heaven full of redundant copies of the same people? Is there someone up there who called me an imposter? It's dumb luck, right? 
and I woke up in the right body. I basically flipped a coin, and if I had called the wrong side, I'd be rotting away at Omicron. I mean, there's nowhere to know, right? You didn't hit the make sure Simon wakes up in the right body switch, did you? Not that you would know. I mean, he would still claim to be the right Simon. Christ. This is awful. We did an awful fucking thing. And you wouldn't mind. Why would you? How could you know that it's not me, the me that I am, the same that I've always been? Please say something. I don't want to think. Please. I don't know what to say. I don't want to upset you. Say anything. When I was little, I used to climb the stairs all the way to the top of the building. And I could still feel how I had to, you know, tuck my arm so I could push the heavy steel door open. Well, the first time that I dared go up there, I stepped out onto the roof and watched the smog rise and fall over Taipei. I got all the way up to the corner ledge and, you know, I felt the warm wind in my hair and the sun was setting and the streets below were shadowed by the tall buildings. The people pushing through the crowd flowed like paint from an artist's brush. Street food vendors filled the air with aromas of all my favorite foods. For a brief moment, I felt connected to the world in a way that I never had before. It was the most profound feeling of comfort and sense of belonging I could ever hope for. I really never felt the same way again, but I went up to the roof many times after. I'm not religious, but I can see why people would be. The privilege of being makes a strong case, at least every once in a while. Do you still feel that sense of awe? Even like this? Things are different, but we're still here. What's the point of going on? Everyone's gone. All the people still left are digital copies trapped in computers at the bottom of the sea. We'll never be able to rebuild or reclaim what we were. Are you really so unhappy being what you are, or is this about the man who went for a scan a hundred years ago? Both, I guess. When I was back in Toronto, even the worst case, the darkest futures I could predict, they at least included my previous life somehow. I feel so uprooted. There's nothing here that I recognize, nothing that makes me feel like I belong. Even if we make it to the yard, would it be any different? still be alone. No friends. No family. You could make new friends. I'm sure everyone would like to know the time traveler. If not, you still have... Now, after talking, the power shuts down out of nowhere, of course, typical Soma fashion. What would it be without the power shutting down or crashing and burning? Anyways, these really cool uh, jellyfish start floating around you. And I'm not exactly sure if this part has any kind of symbolic meaning, but I just think visually it's, it's really interesting. Now, in order to turn the power back on to the climber, you have to climb out of it and get on top to restore the power. And Simon starts talking to Catherine about the concept of time. Does does time freeze when you're not powered? Time feels omitted more than anything. What's the difference? I don't feel like I'm being held back or hindered. And I don't have the opportunity to reflect on the time I'm missing. It's simply missing. Sounds like sleeping without the dreaming. Yes, but generally you anticipate when you're about to sleep and there's a natural continuation since we tend to wake up where we went to sleep. My experience is more like an ever-changing moment that never really seems to find closure. Sounds kind of like a movie being edited live. I suppose so. I guess it sounds exciting, but it really keeps me activated to the point of exhaustion. <sighs> it's rough. Could be worse. Could be a time traveler stuck in a body made from black goo. Out of nowhere, Simon's brain glitchiness starts going crazy again, and a creature starts climbing his way onto the tram. This creature being none other than Johan Ross himself. The telepathic dude from Omicron telling that you you did it, and then he will make preparations. Yay, Johan Ross is excited. Yes, cool, Johan Ross. And for whatever reason, you get knocked out right here. I don't know why. Simon really just seems to be susceptible to being knocked out, I guess. And when you come to, Catherine asked you what that was about and what it was. 
does. And she exclaims that it just stood there looking at you before throwing itself into the abyss. Now I really wish right here, Simon would have made some kind of joke telling her that he was trying to reach him about his car's extended warranty. I feel like tossing in this little comedic bit would have just been the icing on the cake of this game. But I'm also an idiot who finds stupid shit funny. Anyways, you continue the tram descent, eventually reaching the ocean floor. Now this area is probably the scariest area of the game. And not, not really because there's any scary enemies. Well, I mean, there are some scary stuff, but just, just being at the absolute bottom of the ocean in the black abyss with nobody around is absolutely fucking terrifying. Now being down here is a little bit weird because the way that they navigate down here, because it is so dark, is through the use of two-sided color lights that's set up to use a pathway between Tau and to the climber. If you are following the red lights, you are headed back to the climber. And if you are following the blue lights, you're headed to Tau. Pretty simple setup we got going on here. Tau being the place that we uh, need to get to currently. Now down here is uh, where you eventually stumble upon the uh, Leviathan. Yeah, there's, there's a damn Leviathan here, which essentially was just a giant squid that is heavily mutated by the WoW and the structure gel. Now this is mostly harmless for now, unless you decide to stray too far away from the light in which he will fuck your ass two times to Sunday. I don't know what that means, but it sounds rough. Now, after following the lights to Tau, they eventually disappear, which is where you're able to turn on this little light bot that will help you navigate around. Well, guess fucking what? The bitch ass Leviathan comes and eats your damn light bot. And since there are no more blue lights to follow anymore, you kind of just get stuck there in the darkness, which is probably the most annoying thing in the game that happens. Like I just, you just lose all direction. Now, if you have good RNG in your life, which personally I don't, you eventually stumble upon a little cave that's filled with little glow sticks on the floor that lead you through the cave and spit you out back into the darkness where unfortunately uh, got my ass eaten by the Leviathan. I don't know this 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 part was really confusing and i spent a lot of time wandering around before i luckily eventually stumbled upon the blue lights again leading me to tau now side tau is very important because this is where the arc was manufactured but it never got its way to the space gun which is where it needs to be the space gun being the device that shoots the arc into space Another very self-explanatory name. Now, there is an enemy here that goes by the name Jin Yoshida, and he was a Japanese scientist who was an operative on Pathos 2, stationed here at Tau. In Soma, he serves as both a minor character as well as an enemy, as by the time Simon encounters him, he has been mutated into a mindless, hostile creature. Much like the proxy, Yoshida demonstrates the ability to open closed doors, but if Simon maintains eye contact with him, Yoshida hesitates and stops moving. Not unlike a coil head from Lethal Company. Company. Wow, another Lethal Company reference. Good job, bro. But don't stare at him for too long because he will uh, eventually spring back into attack mode. Immediately after Simon turns his back, he will break into a shambling sprint, making him pretty difficult to evade. Now, if you get too close to him, you should try to maintain eye contact with him and move backwards. But if he catches you, he will attack you with his facial tentacles and knock you the fuck out. Now, Jin Yoshida's keen senses make him extremely difficult to evade, but he can be delayed by closing him in rooms, buying some time about three seconds while he forces the door open. As with most other creatures, it is recommended to keep moving to avoid being cornered, closing doors along the way. Yoshida's eyesight means that he can be misled by hiding in dark rooms and his keen hearing means he can be distracted by opening and closing doors. Now, Yoshida's real appearance before being mutated is never seen in the game. His face is nothing more than protruding tentacles and the rest of his body is covered by a Hamatsu power suit, which is what we're currently wearing right now. In his mutated form, Yoshida has been merged with a power suit via structure gel, which is had the side effect of making him one of the strongest and fastest mutated entities on Pathos 2. Now, luckily, he doesn't know how to climb ladders. So once Simon finds a ladder to climb up, Yoshida becomes a thing of the past. Now, Simon ends up in a room that was basically the living quarters on Tau, and it housed some of the most important personnel on Pathos 2. In one of the rooms, you find two men dead on their beds, one being controlled by structure gel coming out of the wall. Unfortunately, there is no way to disconnect him, so you kind of just have to leave him be. The other guy, though, is he's actually actually dead. And once you data mine him, you actually find out that he was someone Catherine was involved with. What did we do? Hey, try not to think about it. My whole life, I've been a good man. We messed up, Sarah. There, there. We should have launched. Taken the chance. There's time. If Ashkin says we could try again, when things calm down. You gotta do it, you know. 
You got to. <laughs> He died holding a picture of her in his hand. Simon then finds out from a tablet that they likely died from starvation due to being at the bottom of the ocean and they're not being powered Omicron or anyone there to get the climber back down to them so they could get back up. And while you were here the entire time, Dr. Ross is communicating with Simon, telling him that he needs to leave Tau. He is very, very much in a rush to get the WoW destroyed, which is what his ultimate goal is. And if you're wondering where the hell is Catherine's body, because she was also down here working on the Ark, you will find out in the near future why her body is not in any of these headquarters. <laughs> Now, after continuing on, you eventually stumble upon a console that helps you open up an otherwise locked door, which um, you end up seeing an actual living, breathing human being. This part kind of tripped me up a little bit because so far you really only encounter reanimated corpses or robots that talk to you. And then all of a sudden there's a living person right in front of you. It's just, I, I don't know, it kind of startled me a little bit. Now, the woman in this chair is none other than Sarah Lindwall, an aerospace engineer who served as a payload technician on Pathos 2. She was a member of the crew that was helping Catherine carry the Ark to Phi. And according to the Soma Wiki, she is the last living human on Earth, spending her life guarding the Ark from the WoW. Now you begin talking to her, and at first she doesn't trust you. I mean, clearly, you're in a robo suit. Like, if I was the last person alive, I, I wouldn't trust you either. But once you begin talking to her a little bit, you find out that she, in fact, doesn't understand that humanity has been wiped out at all, and that she is the last person alive. She doesn't understand that either. You explain to her that you have been to all of the compounds, and that you haven't seen a single human being. She asks you what you want with the Ark, and you tell her that you want to take it to Phi and launch it into space, and she reluctantly lets you after she understands that you're kind of the last hope for the Ark. She then tells you that she wants you to turn off her life support so that she can die in peace. Of course, Simon is weary of that, but I, I think that he realizes that it needs to be done. There is really no logical reason for her to continue living on in this miserable world that the WoW has created. And of course, during her last moments of Alive, I I had to do this. Ian, Nick, Jasper, even Kat. People thought she was weird because she was quiet. <laughs> she was cool. I was just seeing this. <laughs> Simon, still just there? doing some like I'm CSGO here, fucking aim hack Don't shit. <laughs> So after that silly little nonsense, Simon takes the Ark down to the transport area so we can get it over to Phi. And this part is uh, fairly uneventful as you basically just follow the Ark until you get to a point where you're blocked off by debris and you need to find another way to Phi. You eventually make your way to another structure on Tau where Johan Ross really starts tapping into your psyche and talking to you. He explains to you that the suit that you're currently wearing contains enzymes that are poisonous to the WoW. The structure gel that we got on Omicron that we added to the power suit ended up making the suit essentially a venomous snake for the WoW. And after trekking on and after this conversation, you end up in a room with this big giant glob of the WoW structure gel in the middle of the room and Johan Ross standing by it. He tells Simon that this is the heart of the WoW and that this controls all of the structure gel on Pathos 2, which just physically looking at it kind Kind of makes sense because it, it almost resembles those healing buttholes we encountered during the game which give life to simon somebody that was initially created because of the wow also being the thing that some of the mockingbirds were attached to in the beginning of the game providing them with life now you are given the option here to kill it or to not kill it and most people watching this video or playing this game obviously you would think oh i gotta kill it i gotta get the wow was the whole reason this is you know I, the world is covered in black goo and monstrosities and all the negativity going on in the world but hear me out there are two moral sides to this decision on one hand killing the wow seems like the same thing to do the wow is essentially a cancer on earth that spreads itself looking for any kind of entity to take over but on the other hand by not killing it you can also argue that the wow is the last thing on earth keeping anything alive other than that girl we met on tau any living being in this world is only able to live on due to the wow's existence so this decision really kind of comes down to how you decide to look at it and if you've made it this far in the video i would love for you to comment telling me either the decision you made playing this game or if you haven't played the game and you're just watching the video what would be the decision that you would make now personally i chose to kill the wow and i'm gonna let past me explain why i made this decision the whole 
Everything on the world is just dead. Like, this will kill every fish. This will kill every piece of technology. Every human it's keeping alive. Every animal. Every, like, monster. The monsters. I mean, it's bad, though. Because, like, let's say in, you know, several million years, the Earth becomes habitable, habitable again. We go through... We go through evolution all again, then the WoW's still gonna be here and it's just gonna never let evolution grow because it's just gonna be Back off, okay? taking over everything, you know? Because if we set off the Ark, we set off to the Ark, like this is gonna be the last thing. I mean, that woman, that woman in that room was the last person alive. So there's no humans on the Earth again. It's the ultimate mercy kill. Yeah, because it's literally keeping like it's making old it's making people monsters just roaming the earth just endless and they're gonna live forever too just in this like misery state this aggressive misery state yeah i'm gonna have to kill the wow after simon enters his arm in the mega butthole and gets his arm ripped off he eventually comes to now i don't think this really affects the ending of the game this isn't really a clementine will remember that type of thing this is more of just an internal moral decision which is why i really love this game so so much like you don't really need to make a certain decision here it really just kind of sets you up to do what you want to do but I, I guess if you choose not to kill the wow this simon gets to keep his arm which really is not that important now if you play this game yourself or if you're watching this video for the first time i really want you to leave a comment telling me what decision you made or what decision you would make if you did play please i did what you wanted you did good simon but you can't leave the only way to make sure the wow stays dead is to destroy the only one who's immune to the new pattern don't worry i'll make it quick And yeah, that just happened. So Johan Ross is basically just Leviathan Chow now, but as quickly as it disappeared, it comes back out and chases you out of Tau. Now this big fucker will try to kill you. It is a lot more aggressive than when it was down in the bottom of the ocean. I'm guessing mainly because it can see you better now. I, I don't know, but really all you gotta do is just hide behind some rocks and get your little robot ass to fire as quickly as possible. If he does, however, get a hold of you, he will pick you up in his tentacles mouth thingy and bring you to another random location hopefully closer to five but just it, it, he's pretty easy to avoid just don't just don't die here don't hey just just get to five now after entering Phi, you eventually stumble into a room and find the ark that has been fully transported and you pick that big fucker up and you take it into the room where you can enter it into the illustrious space gun man i really wish they would have gave this a cooler name i feel kind of silly calling it just a space gun but it is what it is in this room you actually find on the floor the decaying corpse of none other than Catherine Chun herself. You data mine her and find out that her crew wanted to leave the Ark in the bottom of the ocean thinking that it will be safer there than if it were floating around in space. Which I gotta side with Catherine here because if you know anything about space, the distance between any two objects is incredibly massive and only growing more and more over time. The likeliness of the Ark ever actually hitting something in the span of a billion fucking years is very little to none but leaving it down here on Earth gives it a high chance that the WoW will get access to it, possibly ruining the whole thing. So during this altercation, Catherine gets very upset and obviously disagrees, and it doesn't really take a rocket scientist to hear, yeah, rocket scientist space, yeah, I know, funny, funny, to realize that she was murdered by a wrench sitting next to her and the dried blood all around her head and all over the floor. And we know that her black box didn't override because we can still data mine her. After heading back to the console, you talk to Catherine on the Omni tool and you tell her what happened but she acts really confused. And that's because the current scan of her on the Omni tool, the Catherine that we know, does not remember any of that, obviously. She only remembers everything that happened up until the point of her brain scan back on Theta. So everything that happened between that brain scan and her dying here at Phi, the current scan of her has no recollection, which was a, a, a big reason for Mark Serang's continuity theory and the reason that he got so many people to kill themselves after they're having their brain scan. Now, after attaching the arc to the space gun, prepping it for launch, you head outside onto this metal scaffolding area and you step into a pilot seat to control the gun and to essentially transfer your scan yet again onto the arc. And luckily, Catherine is there to help guide you through this. You are then put into a scene where there is a countdown and you and Catherine's scan are being uploaded to the arc right before the arc takes off the 
space. And after that happens, you hear Simon cheering because he has finally done what he's been working toward this entire journey. Except he again forgot one little thing. The scan that just happened created a new Simon that is now on the Ark, not transferring his mind. So here. Catherine? Catherine? I'm here. What the hell happened? What went wrong? Nothing. They're out there, among the stars. We're here. No. When we were getting on the Ark, I saw it. It finished loading just before it launched. Yeah, I saw. Then why are we still here? Simon, I can't keep telling you how it works. You won't listen. You know why we're here. You were copied onto the Ark. You just didn't carry over. You lost the coin toss. We both did. Just like Simon and Omicron, just like the man who died in Toronto a hundred years ago. No, 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 this is bullshit. We came all this way. We launched the Ark. I know it sucks, but our copies are up there. Catherine and Simon are both safe on the Ark. Be happy for them. Are you crazy? We're gonna die down here with those fuckers living at large on a spaceship. They're not us. They're not us. I'm sorry you feel that way, Simon. I'm proud of what we did. We made sure that something of the hundreds of thousands of years of human history survived, that something lives on. No, 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 no. Fuck this! Fuck! Fuck this! Fuck you! Fuck you, Catherine! You lied! And I believed in you! I trusted you! You said we're getting on the fucking Ark! We are on the Ark, you idiot! I didn't lie! I can't be responsible for your goddamn ignorance! You fucking fuck! Catherine? Please don't leave me alone. Catherine? Catherine? And that, ladies and gentlemen, was Soma. Thank you so much for joining this journey with me and watching this, except wait, there's more. The new Simon wakes up in a chair inside of a cave only to stumble out and experience what seems like paradise compared to the previous life that he lived. After walking a little more down the path, you end up meeting with Catherine, explaining that you are both so happy that you made it. And the game finishes by watching the Ark fly off into space while you can see a lifeless, destroyed Earth in the background. Now this game was one of the most profound, mind-altering games I have ever played in my life, if not the absolute most. It truly blows my mind how a video game, a piece of media, can really make you think about real-world implications. Like what is it really to be alive? I mean when you really sit there and think about it, all our bodies are is just a giant clump of different cells. Like what are we? What what makes us alive? And I feel like that is a question that is never really going to get truly answered, at, at least in our lifetime. Do you think that if you were put in the position where you knew that you were no longer in your previous physical form, but only manifested as a brain scan on a piece of hardware floating in space, would 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 you be happy? I mean, personally, I feel like I feel like I think I could get over it, knowing that I will essentially live an endless life in in the bliss and the oasis that the Ark has created. But I do feel like in the beginning, it would be very existential. Even though I know that, yeah, I'm living a, just basically a perfect life, I would forever know that I'm only doing it on this little tiny piece of hardware that's just floating around in space. But at the same time, you can argue Earth is kind of the same thing. We're all essentially just little tiny bugs on a rock floating through space, living out our mostly meaningless life. Life is kind of really what you make it yourself. I don't know. I, I would really like to hear how you guys perceive it in the comments below. I want to know how other people's minds work when it comes to this kind of thing. But with all that being said, thank you so much for taking this journey with me. I highly suggest you play this game for yourself as I personally have both watched this game be played and played it myself and playing it myself was just, it just felt a lot different. But if you made it this far into the video, I applaud you and I will hopefully see you in the next video. Until next time. So before we finish this video off officially, there's a couple extra things I would like to talk about that I couldn't really find a proper place for in this video. One of those things being the IRL dramatization of Soma. Not necessarily the entire game itself, and the dramatization doesn't even really have to do with Simon or Catherine. The story is kind of centered around what happens with Imogen Reed, who was one of Catherine's colleagues, and also the first body that Simon was uploaded to before he changed over to the power suit. 
And it is also centered around Adam Golaski, who was the guy talking to his own Mockingbird in the IRL clip that I included at the beginning of chapter two. Now, these videos are available to watch. And if you love this video in this game as much as I did, then I really urge you to go watch these videos yourself. They are on a playlist on Frictional Games YouTube channel, and I will include the link to the playlist in the description of this video so you can go watch it yourself. There also is another video on Frictional Games channel that was posted two years before the game actually came out, and it is titled Soma Gameplay Teaser Trailer. And you might be wondering why this is important enough to talk about, but this trailer is actually not part of the final release of the game. It depicts, uh, I believe still Simon, waking up in more of like a, an underground bunker area, which doesn't really look like any area in the actual finished game. I also believe in this gameplay trailer that the voice actor is actually different than the Simon that they ended up using in the real game. Rasnick. Now that makes me wonder if this is not actually Simon in this gameplay trailer specifically, but it's not really discussed anywhere, so one can only speculate. And after eventually searching around for a little bit, the character eventually makes his way into a room which actually does kind of seem like it would be in the finished game. He eventually gets into a room where there appears to be a brain with a blinking red light on it. And eventually these tentacles start sprouting out of the ground, each one starting to penetrate the brain itself. Now, because this was never really part of the final game. I have no idea what this is supposed to mean. I think that when they created this trailer, they clearly had some kind of different direction they were going to go, which makes me wonder, like, what could the game have been if this had continued? Personally, I love the finished product of Soma, but after seeing this gameplay trailer, kind of makes me think, you know, like, what if? What could this have been? Now, the weirdest part of this gameplay trailer, though, is not actually the gameplay trailer itself. If you click the link in the description of this video, which is www.somagame.com, you get sent to a website that seems like it was made in Windows 2000, and it clearly has not been updated in a long time, hence that the main page promotions are still promoting the PS4 and the Xbox One, but it's it's kind of cool in a way. It's almost like a time capsule. Now, all of the information on this page can be found on the Soma Wiki, but the weirdest part about this website to me is the fact that there's a lot of like broken images, and it kind of almost seems like, and I know this isn't really the intention, but it's kind of almost like the WoW took over this website. Some of the links on here are broken. Every single page has this like cross on it of broken images. I don't know. It's just kind of cool to me to think that like, you know, the wow is real and it, you know, kind of mess with the website. But, you know, I'm a goofy little dude, so that's just me. Now, there is another video I want to include here, and this has nothing to do with Frictional Games itself, but a YouTuber known as Sad Sad the Glad Sad the Glad, I don't know how to pronounce that, but he recently posted an entire almost two hour long iceberg video about Soma. Now, I could have gone through something like this in this video, but I didn't want this video to be five hours long. So if you really, really, really want to get into the nitty gritty of the lore of this game, I urge you to go watch his video, which I will also include down in the description. But yeah, other than that, that's all really the extras I wanted to include in the video. Just some stuff where I didn't really know how to poke it into the main body of this video. But yeah, other than that, if you've made it this far in the video, thank you so much for watching. And if you know of any other games that have as much lore as this game and you want me to make a video on it, just leave a comment down below and I will heavily consider it. And with that being said, I bid you farewell.